Good evening. Very happy to welcome all of you back tonight. This is our eighth presentation on the seven churches of Asia Minor. And for tonight, we're looking at the last one, the Church of Laodicea. And so we're very happy to welcome you if you're joining us by television or if you're tuning in by radio or on the internet. We're very happy that you're here and visiting with us this evening or tuning in by the radio or television. Uh, we hope that these studies on Revelation are beginning to open the book of Revelation up because there's a lot of things that we have looked at that we will see as we continue to go through the book because this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about, is Jesus Christ. And so we'll continue to study the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. And so I see many of you here have your Bibles. And uh, those of you that are watching by television or listening on the radio, we hope that you will get your Bible and as we go through the study, uh, follow us. And this is a good time to take notes or to, uh, uh, to outline or uh, underline your Bible so that you can go back and recap what we have had to say about it. Uh, Today, tonight we're looking, as I mentioned, at the ch church of Laodicea, which is the last of the seven churches, a very, very important one, because the message to Laodicea, folks, is a message to us, because this is to the church that is living just before Jesus comes, and therefore what he has to say applies to us, and we need to look at it very, very carefully so that we know what the Lord is saying and what we need to look at in our own lives to follow and to walk with Him as He would have us to. So we hope it'll bless you as we continue to study uh, the book of Revelation and particularly the seven churches. Uh, I hope as we have gone through this uh, during the week that you have enjoyed the music, uh, particularly of Joe Pearls and Donna Klein. We hope that it has touched your heart and all, and I'm sure you'll be blessed tonight as Joe's going to sing for us. And also, before we have the music each evening, will we have Chuck Algar come out and read to us the section uh, about what we're studying that evening. And tonight, he's going to read about the Church of Laodicea. So, Chuck, come and share that with us. Laodicea, the last of the seven churches. What is the message from a loving God to this church? Let's read about it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodicean write, These things says the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my father's throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, the last of the seven churches, personal letters 
that Jesus wrote to each one of these churches in which he told them about their condition, told them about their problem, talked about the solution to their problem, and gave them promises. This is all what he said to these seven churches. And tonight, we're taking a look at the last one, the church of Laodicea. Now, the simple thing about this last church is this, folks, is the church here in Philadelphia possesses what Laodicea needs. And if Laodicea can acquire what Philadelphia has, Jesus will come back. Did you follow me? If Laodicea can acquire what Philadelphia has, Jesus will come back. And so this last church is a church that is there, and what we must not do, folks, is take for granted that uh, we'll make it. Because he gives a very, very stern, stern rebuke. In fact, the hardest of the seven is to the church of Laodicea. So as we look at it, we want to see what he has to say to it. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write. So to this church, he's writing. Laodicea comes from a Greek, two Greek words, Leo, which means people. Laodicea means judging. It means judging of the people. That's what it stands for. So you and I are living in the time when the judgment is going on up in heaven. And so this is a judging of the people, and we're going to look at some things concerning Laodicea that you and I need to consider very carefully because if we are facing the judgment, then I definitely need Christ to represent me. I need him standing in my place. I need him interceding in my behalf. Very, very vital if I'm going to make it into the kingdom. So this is the church. Now, as we take a look at it, you'll find that Laodicea was about 40 miles uh, southeast of Philadelphia. This opened up the road from Ephesus and from Pergamos came through uh, Philad uh, Laodicea and opened up there to take them on into Syria and Arabia and on into those parts of the world. But the gate for going through that was there at Laodicea. They're the ones that were there. Laodicea is a very, very wealthy city. Actually, was named Laodicea after Antiochus, his wife. It's named after her, which she poisoned him later. I don't know why, but, but she did. Anyhow, uh, it was named after her. And uh, a very, very uh, well-to-do city. The population of the, of the city of Laodicea was largely made up of Syrians and Jews. And these were people that were brought out of Babylon and put there in Laodicea. So at the time that uh, John is writing this, uh, the population of Jews, we found out in that city, was about 7,500 Jews that lived there at that time. That's counting just men, not counting women and children. And so there was a large population of Jews as well as other people in the city of Laodicea. Uh, today, not much left there. It sets out on the plains. It was a very fertile farming land all around it, and uh, all that we have today left there is some of a couple theaters and a stadium, the ruins of those two, and that's basically all we have of the city of Laodicea. It has been taken away. Its candlestick has been moved out of its place not there 
anymore. But the city, as I mentioned, was a very, very wealthy city. Uh, wealthy enough that in 60 A.D. it was destroyed by an earthquake. And the emperor offered to help them rebuild it, and they refused and said they'd build it on their own. And there is a little connection there because as we uh, look at it, you'll find that this church is very, very self-sufficient. It doesn't need help from anybody, not even the Lord. See? So a uh, very strong connection there between that and all. Uh, the city was very modern. Uh, they had hot water pipe to all the homes. Here's one of the aqueducts that uh, flowed into the city of Laodicea, and uh, they had all kinds of access to uh, hot water in, in their homes and all. Uh, it was a very, very modern city, very up-to-date. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, if you look at that carefully, there's a crustacean around the inside of it. Uh, the mineral springs there were very high in mineral, mineral content, and they had a crustacean there. In fact, uh, about seven or eight miles from uh, Laodicea is uh, Heropolis, and there is where the great source of water came from, and it was so heavy in minerals that it would form formations even on the falls, so that you could, uh, you could see it for several miles away, look like white statues all, all over, quite spectacular as to what it did there. Also, in the city of Laodicea, they had a garment industry, and there they uh, made a black cloth the, from black sheep that they had there, and the texture was very soft and very similar to silk, and it was very, very uh, special and expensive and sought for, the, the black uh, garments that they put out of Laodicea. And so there was uh, a lot connected with it. In the city of Laodicea, they had uh, a school of medicine, uh, one of the uh, schools for the goddess, the god uh, Scapulus, who was the Greek god of medicine, and uh, they had it there, and they practiced. Also, they had a eye salve that they saw, sold, a Fijian eye salve that people could buy. So these were all the things that took place there in uh, Laodicea that has reference that Christ makes to the church there and the people that lived in Laodicea at that time. Okay, let's see as Christ identifies himself what he says to the church here. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Hmm. Only place in Scripture that you find that the name Amen is applied to Christ. Amen is used many places in Scripture, don't misunderstand me, but this is the only place that is put there as a name, says the Amen. And there's, I believe, reason for that, uh, using it as a name to Christ. Uh, actually, the word Amen means so be it, is what it implies. And I think that as Christ is giving the message, he's telling them this is it, this is the way it is, so be it. And uh, we need to look at it that way. Also, when we finish praying, we say amen, which means the prayer is finished. And Christ is telling them here, these messages to the seven churches is finished. It's over. It's what he's getting across to them. So he's saying that he is the amen, the first and the last, the faithful and true witness that Jesus Christ is the true witness and that you and I need to listen very carefully to what he has to say. He is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, I want to take just a moment on this because uh, there's some people that misunderstand this text. 
It says here he is the beginning of the creation of God. That means he is the creator. That he is the one that creates. He's the beginning. He's the one that made things. He's the one that possesses it. There are some people that want to take this text and apply it and say, and this is saying that Jesus is not divine. That he was the beginning of God's creation. No, that's not what that text is saying. It's saying that he is the creator. That he's the one that created all things. And this is one of the texts that you find that Arianism comes from and what they teach in regard to Arianism. But Jesus Christ is the creator. He is the Son of God. Okay, let's continue on. Church age. This comes at a time in which it's clear from what the Scripture says. This is the church that will be there or should be there when Jesus comes back. Uh, as I've told you, do not try to pinpoint a date. I put down 1900 about when it began. And basically, the uh, reason I did that is because we are living, folks, in an age of secularism. Uh, I told you when we talked about uh, Philadelphia and them coming out of the period of time in which there was uh, scientific evidence and they began to question the Bible and all that and atheism rose. Uh, this period of time we've moved in have kind of moved out of that and we've moved into secularism. And that's all that people seem to be concerned today with is what they can have materialistically, what they can get. Uh, one who has the most toys wins. It's strictly secularism. And so uh, pick, picking up that period of time and going from there, this is the period of time that represents the time of Laodicea. Let's see what he says is the conditions I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. He said, I know your works. I've looked at them. I wish you, and by the way, uh, they're, not, they're not lacking in works here. We'll come to that in a minute. They're, the church of Laodicea is not lacking in works, folks. There's plenty of works there. He said, I know your works. But I wished that you were either cold or hot, because you are neither cold nor hot. Now, when he says, and most translators and most uh, Bible scholars and theologians, uh, they will take that to say that cold means that you don't know the Lord and that you're, uh, you're living out in the world and you don't know Christ and you're, you're cold, you're lost. You don't have any relationship that way. Uh, they take hot and say hot means that you're on fire for the Lord and, and working and, and all this. That's, they apply that word hot that way. And, and maybe it does have a meaning that way, folks. But I prefer to look at it a different way. I prefer to look at it and say it means God saying, I wish you were uncomfortable. I wish you were either cold that you were uncomfortable, that you were cold, or you were hot, you were uncomfortable. He's trying to say, get out of being lukewarm. Would that you were either hot or cold, you weren't, weren't comfortable. This is, this is the problem with the, the church. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. We were over in Africa holding meeting in Africa, and here people came by the thousands. And out in the bush, I mean way out in the bush, uh, here we are, there's some 10,000 of them there out in the, the bush. There is one pump in the middle of the compound for water. There are no facilities uh, out there at all, just out in the bush. And they come and they sit on the ground and sat there all day. And my question to you is, how many of you will do that? How many of you would go out where there was, you know, 
no facilities, no electricity, no, no, uh, none of the modern things that you have, and sit on the ground to hear the Word of God preached. You see, we, uh, no, we're comfortable. We, we like it. It's, uh, it's nice, you know. This is the way we are. He's saying, I wish you were uncomfortable. I wish you were either cold or hot. That's what he's wanting us to be. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. See, the Lord's saying, listen, uh, just because you go to church, just because you say, Lord, Lord, that doesn't make, make you right with God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out devils in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? Said, oh, we've, we've done all these things, done many what? Wonderful works in your name. And Jesus said, I know your works. I, I know that. I'm aware of that. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. lawlessness. Uh, he said, I don't recognize you. I don't know who you are. They said, well, Lord, we did all these wonderful works for you. And he said, sorry, I don't know who you are. That something must be there that is more than just works. Has to be. In churches today, comfortable. Uh, we have entered an age, church-wise folks, where people think that they have to be entertained. They, they, they can't seem to come for the purpose of worship. They feel they have to be entertained. If it's not entertaining, well, there. And, and thus, we have church after church after church across this nation where every church service is a big show. It's a production that they do because people come there to be entertained, not to study the Word of God. This is what he's talking about to the church of Laodicea because they're lukewarm, satisfied, something wrong. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit, out, vomit you out of my mouth. He said, since you're, you're neither cold nor hot, it makes me sick. That's what he's saying. Makes me sick. I will vomit you out of my mouth. And so if you and I are just, you know, comfortable and uh, not really doing anything, we better take a good close look, folks, because he says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. You see, in Laodicea, the water came out from up by Heropolis, and it flowed down through there. By the time it reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And this is, was the problem there. You're looking at the stream right there from it. As it flowed, it was lukewarm water. But, dear friend, if you drank it, it tasted like kerosene spiked with Alka-Seltzer. It didn't taste good. It, just, it was very, very, uh, something you wanted to spew out of your mouth. Made, made you sick. And, and he said, this is the way this church is to me. It makes me sick the way they are because they have let the cares of this world come into their life. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire 
for other things entered and choked the word, and it became unfruitful. You see, it, the world came into the church, and it choked out the word. And the people, people became unfruitful. You see, do you, uh, do you have any trouble speaking to somebody about Jesus Christ? Do you, do you have trouble witnessing? You and I should be witnessing to people around us, talking to them about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Let's see what the Lord says the problem is. Because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? When I was a kid, went to a little old country school, we used to sing a song. The song said, fly in the buttermilk, shoe, fly, shoe. I don't know if you remember that. But in other words, what I'm trying to tell you, there's something wrong with this church. There's definitely a problem of fly in the buttermilk. And, and that is what it's saying here when it says, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, the problem here, folks, is they're all this. They're wealthy. They have need of nothing. I'm rich. Have need of nothing. That's the way we see ourselves. Don't need anything. Good shape. And the problem is they don't know it. They don't know it. If they knew it, they might do something about it. But they don't even know it. And he says, do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked? All those things. And that's describing, folks, the spiritual condition of the church. That's what it's talking about. That they're poor. That means they don't have anything spiritually. They're bankrupt spiritually. They're, they're wretched. They spiritually are blind, and they're naked. And those are things that's their condition, and there's certain things that Christ gives that takes care of that. But the problem is you can't take care of it if you don't know you need it. You follow me? They're, they're, the answer's here. We'll look at the answer. But if you don't know you need it, then you're not going to look for it. And dear friends, the only thing I can tell you is you and myself and every one of us ought to be on our knees praying that God will open our eyes and that we will see our need. Because he's got the answer. He's got what it needed to take care of the problem. But you and I, unfortunately, go about our activities day by day and unaware of our need. What does Christ have to do to get our attention? And what does he have to do to get our attention? Uh, maybe it takes natural disaster. Maybe it takes more than just saying, repent, change your way. Maybe it takes the loss of something. But he's having a hard time, a difficult time, getting our attention, folks. Because he says, and we're going to come to it, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice, 
And he's saying, hello? Hello, do you hear me? And the problem is, not only are we blind, but we're deaf. We don't see, we don't hear, we don't even know our need. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bru wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. From the top of the head to the sole of the foot, nothing but bruises and sores. We're, we're a mess. That's literally, we're a mess. A and we don't, don't recognize it as he says here, do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind and naked. This is where the church of Laodicea is. And dear friend, if there was ever a period in time which that depicts it, it's today. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And it says that they all, what? Slumbered and slept. All ten of them. Not just five. All ten of them slumbered, slumbered and slept. And it says, the cry came, behold, the bridegroom is coming. And they got up and shook themselves and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Are you taking time? Are you taking time to make sure that the vessel is filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit? Are you, or are you uh, too busy? Or, or, or maybe you don't need anything. Increased with goods. Have need of nothing. And when the bridegroom shows up, you say, oh, not enough oil. But the wise answered, saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. You see, that's, there's a lot there, folks. Go out and buy for yourselves. When it comes to this part, there's no, nothing anybody can do for you. You're not going to be saved by your wife. You're not going to be saved by your husband. You've got to go and you have to buy for yourself. And you buy without money, without price. But you got to go by, and you have to be filled. But, dear friend, the problem here with these virgins isn't that they didn't go to buy. They went to buy. The problem is they waited too late. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. You see, these, these people were those that they had the opportunity. They, this is not talking about uh, people that don't know the Lord. This is not talking about non-church members. This is talking about church members. And they went out to buy, and while they were out buying, the bridegroom came, and the door was shut. The door that was opened 
in Philadelphia is shot in Laodicea. And you remember, they knocked on the door, said, Lord, let us in. Let us in. And he said, sorry, I don't know you. Why didn't he know them? Why didn't, why didn't he know these five? Because they were not like him in character. That's the problem. They were not like him in character. Therefore, he didn't recognize him. He said, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. So let's see, as we've taken a look at this, what counsel he gives to take care of it. How can it be taken care of? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garment that you may be clothed, okay? That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eye with eye salve that you may see. Now, he's taking care of this question of blind and poor and, uh, and not having things and, uh, what say, blind and poor and uh, naked. He takes care of all those things, each one. So he ta says, buy of me gold that has been refined in the fire. Do you know what gold is? Do you know what gold is? When I'm not talking about literal, I'm not referring to that, I'm talking about spiritually. Do you know what gold is? Hmm? Well, let me tell you what gold is. Three things, as far as God's Word is concerned. This is gold. God's Word. That's gold. And you have to come to the Scripture and spend time in the Scripture. That is absolutely necessary because the other two things that are gold is dependent upon this. And if you don't spend time in the Word of God, then, dear friend, you're not going to get the other two things that's absolutely necessary if you're going to make it into God's kingdom. The other thing that is gold that comes only by this is faith. Faith is gold. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you and I must spend time in the Word so that I will begin to, to possess faith and it begins to work in my life. And that is absolutely necessary. If you don't have faith, you can't make it. Faith is absolutely required. Without faith, you cannot please God. They're very, very clear. So faith is gold. Put it down. You're wanting to know how can I help my poor condition? Then, dear friend, you've got to have faith. Absolutely necessary. The third thing is that's gold is love. So you see, Love and faith work together. And you've got to have love if it's going to take place. If you don't have love for the Lord, you don't have love for your brethren, if you don't have love for people, dear friend, you are in jeopardy. You are in problems. You've got to love one another. That is absolutely required. And the way you get those is by spending time in the Word of God drawing near to him. Works won't get you there. Works won't get you there. Take something more than that. I spent my life in evangelism. And, and I don't mean this in the wrong way. But the church... And I, when I say the church, I'm talking about all of us. When you, when you talk about evangelism and preaching God's Word, almost invariably, you know what people want to know? 
How many people were baptized? How many people were baptized? Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe that uh, that's important. But, dear friend, numbers is not, is not the change of heart. Uh, we, we have to talk about and preach and pray for the Holy Spirit that God's Spirit will come in and work in, in people's lives. And still today, it's that way. Almost invariably, when we ask somebody about what kind of meeting they had, uh, they want to know how many numbers there was. And, uh, and that's, that's part of works. That's where the works comes into it. And as Laodicea, we are work orientated. And uh, we have all these things that we can look at. We have these buildings. We have churches. We have hospitals. We have publishing houses. We have all these all over the world next to the largest parochial system in the world. All that we have. And we say, look at this. God's saying, you're not understanding. You're really poor. You don't have anything. That, that's our condition. That's where we are. And so you've got to have, you've got to have faith. You have to have love if it's going to be what it should be. Secondly, he supplies our need by giving us the garment of his righteousness. And I hear people say, well, our our righteousness is as filthy rags. That it is. But that's not what he's saying. That's not what he says in this, this here. He says, you're naked. That's what he says. Just read it. He said, you don't even have anything on. He said, you ought to take a good look, and you ought to be ashamed of walking around naked. That's what he's saying. You don't have any righteousness. It's not even as good as filthy rags. We don't have anything at all. You're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. That's the way you are. And he said, if you don't come to me and to be covered with his righteousness, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Zealous means what? Get with it. Stop playing around. Get with it. Be zealous. Repent. Change where you're going. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through what? Love. Here's the gold, folks. Faith working through love. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. So be rich, have faith, have love, spend time with the Lord. And to her, church, was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Get it clear. I have people that read this text all the time, but they never talk about one word that's in this text. And it says to her was what? What? Granted. That means you don't have it of yourself. It was granted for her to have it. Given to her the righteousness of Jesus Christ that covers your life and mine. This is the righteousness of Christ. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. If you don't have that, then I'm sorry. You're running around unclothed. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is the righteousness of Christ that covers our lives, gives to us his righteousness. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, I, I talk to people, 
and I'm talking about church members, and, and, and they, they say to me, Oh, Brother Cox, I, I, I don't see that. And naturally they don't see it because their eyesight's not very good. They're lacking in eyesight. They need eyesalve. They need to be able to see what God's Word is saying. You see, it, we must understand, and you won't understand what God is doing until you understand the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what opens your eyes, is the grace of Christ being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. When you see His grace, you see His love, you see what He's done, then your eyes begin to open up, much more than having now been justified by His blood, therefore having been justified by faith. Okay? This is the way it comes. This is the way it happens in your life and mine. Grace is the source that's the eye salve. When you understand grace, your eyes get opened up and you can see and you understand. Blood is the means. That's the white raiment. For as we wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb, and the blood of the Lamb makes them what? Makes them white. Faith is the method. That's how you and I lay hold of it. That is the gold. So here's the solution to the problem, folks. Christ is offering you the solution to the problem. And the problem of it is, is we don't see it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Christ, standing at the door and knocking. This is the problem of the church of Laodicea. This is the problem right here. Because Christ is on the outside. That's where the problem is. He's not inside. He's outside. And he's knocking at the door asking for entrance. And dear friend, he won't force himself. You've got to invite him in. And he says, if anyone hears my voice, he's, he's calling out. He's asking for you and to me to open the door, let him in, to come into our lives, to change us, to make us different to become acquainted with us so that when you're down to the end, he won't say, I don't know you. I've never been to your house. I've never dwelt with you. I've never supped with you. I've never had a meal with you. I don't know you. He's knocking at the door, saying, let me in. Invite him in, folks. Don't wait. And then he gives a promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He says, if you'll just let me in, then I'll come in and sup with you. And he that overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me in my throne. What a marvelous, marvelous opportunity to sit with Christ on his throne, thrones in the Orient were room for more than one person to sit by them. They had place for a person to sit on the left and on the right. And Christ is saying, open your heart up. If you overcome, I'll let you sit with me on my throne as I overcame, sat down with my Father on his throne. And so he has written to the churches of Asia Minor. And he said to them, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, I pray tonight that the church of Laodicea will hear, that it will listen and accept his invitation. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, that we may be willing to accept your invitation, that we'll open the door, invite you in, and that we might commune with you, and that all of us may be in your kingdom because we've opened our hearts and invited you into our lives. For these things we thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we're down to the end of the seven churches. Our next session or series will be on visions from the throne room in heaven. And we'll be looking at Revelation 4, 5, 6, 7, and so forth. God bless you. Thank you.